a very warm welcome to everyone, to those who are online, those who have just joined the conference. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this panel discussion on gender transformative humanitarian action and humanitarian principles. I'm Gauda Milashut, I work as a research fellow uh, at the Center for Humanitarian Action, and it is my great pleasure to moderate the session today. Uh, before we start, for those who have just joined us, uh, I would like to say that there is a live captioning function, not only here in the room, but also on Zoom. It can be accessed uh, either um, directly in the Zoom as subtitles or by opening a separate window in your browser. And you should be able to find the link to the live captioning function in the Zoom chat. Thank you so much for your interest in this topic, uh, a topic which might not always be discussed, but which I think often stays at the back of, back of our heads. And in the recent deca decades, a lot of progress has been made with regard to gender in humanitarian action. And if we're talking about the humanitarian transformation, which is the topic of this conference, gender transformation could and probably should be part of this humanitarian transformation. At the same time, the call for humanitarian action to become more gender transformative worries those who perceive gender transformation as going beyond the humanitarian mandate. Does it, though? So in this panel, we would like to discuss what gender transformation actually means, how it relates to humanitarian principles such as humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, and doing no harm, whose definitions of gender transformation and of the principles count, and what could be the ways forward with respect to gender transformation in humanitarianism. And to discuss this, we have two wonderful experts, one on-site and one online, who I would like to introduce now. So first, I would like to present uh, Dr. Maria Alavde, who is here on stage with me. Maria is a scientist, researcher, and executive director of Women Now for Development, which is the largest women's rights organization delivering services inside Syria and the neighboring countries. Besides offering safe spaces, protection, and empowerment programs, Women Now is a leading organization in feminist knowledge production and gender justice. In March 2016, Maria received the Award of Feminine Success in France, and in May 2016, together with Women Now, she received the Award of Delivering Lasting Change for Commitment to Justice and Dignity from Care International. Thank you so much for being here today, Maria. Also, a very warm welcome to April Pham, who is joining us online. April is a senior gender advisor and the head uh, of gender unit at the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or UNOCHA. April has over 25 years of experience in social justice, human rights, gender equality, and the prevention and response to gender-based violence in development and humanitarian settings. Prior to joining OCHA, April was a senior gender advisor for the Interagency Standing Committee, where she provided strategic interagency support to humanitarian coordinators and country teams in humanitarian situations in Myanmar, Fiji the Pacific, Ukraine, Turkey-Syria cross-border, Yemen, Sudan, South Sudan, and at the global level in Geneva, Switzerland. Earlier in her career, April was a youth worker and women's rights advocate in the NGO sector, as well as worked for the state government in Australia on policy prevention and legislative reforms of issues, on issues of violence against women. Welcome, April, and thank you for being here to share your knowledge and experiences with us. Before we start our discussion, I would like to mention and apologize that because of the time constraints, unfortunately, we won't have a Q&A part in this session. However, if you are on Twitter or on LinkedIn, you are very much encouraged to share your impressions there using the hashtag CHA22. For the audience on site, you might have found pin bar cards on, uh, where you are seated, on your seats. So our idea is to ask you to write your main takeaway from the session, or takeaways, if you have more, uh, and pin it to the board that you can find in the lobby. So afterwards, this will help us to include your perspectives in the overview of this conference. Also, for our online audience, please keep your camera and microphone turned off during the session. And lastly, I would like to mention that this event will be recorded and can be later accessed on YouTube. 
I think these were all the practical aspects, so let's dive into our conversation. And I would like to first ask you, April, to provide us with an overview of what we can understand under the term gender transformation, how this approach is different from gender sensitive or gender responsive approaches, and in the second part of your answer, maybe you could talk about how, in your view, gender transformation relates to humanitarian principles like humanity, neutrality, impartiality, independence, and doing no harm. Over to you, April. Thank you so much. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, joining Maria again uh, for this discussion. Um, it's actually quite timely. I'm joining you from Nairobi, where I've just concluded uh, two weeks of training for um, staff of OCHA, in particular, uh, those who have uh, gender focal points in their roles and responsibilities. And of course, you know, we should all be uh, gender focal points, um, but it's important to have somebody in the organization that is tasked to, um, to follow up some of these issues. Um, I'm excited to be joining the conversation because I do think the humanitarian sector has moved, and yes, it is uh, slow, but we have moved um, quite far, actually, from the first days when I started humanitarian action about 10 years ago. And back in those days, we talked very much about being gender sensitive. Um, and I think we we don't talk in those terms anymore. Um However, I, I do want to caveat that uh, I'm not too optimistic and, and I'm not trying to present a, a rosy picture of where we are. I think we have made progress. But firstly, let me just, uh, I, I have three points. Firstly, we do have to move away from this tick the box approach. And I think for a long time, uh, we've been stuck in this mode, you know, let's have guidance, let's have more checklists, you know, let's have locks in latrines. All of these things that come from a very protectionist lens. How can we protect, you know, women and girls? How can we, you know, ensure that they're not vulnerable? So we're stuck in this um, this mode of vulnerability and, um, you know, being protectionist. And I think we have very much moved away from this approach um, to what we call gender transformation or uh, being more trans, uh, trans transformational. And I think what this essentially means is that. We are tackling issues of power. We are, we are tackling issues of structural um, inequality, but it is no longer a technical matter. Because I think for a long time, and even the provision of gender experts and, and gender specialists in organizations is about um, you know, providing agencies and organizations with that technical expertise. And I think you know, we are challenged now to move away from that and to really tackle beyond these practical needs that women and girls, men and boys have, um, but to look at, you know, strategically, what is it that they want? And just to give you a very concrete example, in OCHA, we updated our gender policy, and the gender policy now has three very explicit policies. And firstly, it's around driving robust gender analysis, which I think you will agree, um, is about trying to look at these power dynamics between men and women, between various groups, um, and how this transforms or informs, um, you know, a person's access uh, to strategic decision making, to humanitarian services. The second priority is around the prevention of gender-based violence. And I think you all agree with me that, you know, statistics are quite harrowing for what happens in an emergency. Um, so we do need to still have that protectionist lens on and to make sure that people are protected, and in particular, women and girls are protected from gender-based violence. And then thirdly, it's to really look at this, um, this lens of participation and decision-making. And I think that because we are very much moving into this space, that for me is a concrete example of how we are, uh, you know, being a bit more transformative. Because we are looking at, you know, participation, um, and basically disrupting the power structure, the power dynamic, um, the discrimination that women uh, traditionally face, um, and all of these systemic barriers to their decision making. And so by focusing uh, on this element, we are trying to um, redress some of that uh, imbalance. I, I know that it's about, um, I guess, disrupting norms, 
And I know that there are quite a number of NGOs in particular that are working with programs in emergencies that very much address, um, you know, social norms, cultural norms, all of these norms, for example, in nutrition programs. Um, you know, how nutrition practices can really have an impact on, you know, children's lives, women's lives. So if we could actually, um, you know, challenge that uh, and change that, it can make quite a difference to, um, to women and, and their families. On this issue of neutrality, I, I think there's been a little bit of a, a, a misconception, and I'd really like to, you know, for us all to play a role in... Um, in challenging that narrative that there is somehow this disconnect or this incompatibility with um, gender equality and humanitarian principles. In actual fact, I think, you know, gender equality is um, very compatible with uh, the principles of humanitarian action, of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence, because essentially what we're doing uh, when we're working on gender equality is trying to promote equal access to rights, responsibilities, opportunities, and resources. And this is exactly what these principles um, are about, right? They're about saying, we want to make sure that all people, regardless of what their gender, what their ethnicity, what their age, and all of these other factors, have equal opportunity to access humanitarian assistance. So how can we not, how can we do that without um, looking through the prism of, um, of gender and how someone's experiencing those rights, those opportunities, those re access to resources. So I do think, you know, we as humanitarians um, need to counter some of these narratives that say they're inco incompatible because we're not really doing anything incompatible. If you're actually practicing the humanitarian principles in the right manner, then you're actually, um, you know, promoting gender equality because you're looking at ensuring that everyone has equal access. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, April. Um, thank you for emphasizing the aspects related to access, related to norms, related to power dynamics. And uh, now I'd like to turn to you, Maria, and could you tell us how you understand a gender transformative way of working? how it is reflected in your work, and what would you say is the role of humanitarian principles in this context? Um, thank you very much, and uh, I cannot agree more than what uh, with uh, uh, April, so I think she already uh, <laughs> presented a lot of what I wanted to say, uh, but maybe what I want to add before entering within our work is, uh, I think part of the discussion is already discussed under the triple nexus, the humanitarian action is interlinked with development and with peace. So we cannot work, uh, each sector cannot work separately from other, uh, from other sectors. And um, um, speaking about the Syrian uh, humanitarian crisis is, uh, uh, is quite unique because it's one of the very few crises when international humanitarian actors were working from outside the country and working with Syrian local organization. And um, according to one research done by our one of our Syrian partner, uh, in around 2015, uh, one, um, the, one of the most common projects uh, within a humanitarian uh, uh, work was women protection. So... Uh, within Syrian organization because it was one of the trend by donor community, which is good. I don't disagree with this. However, when you look at the composition of this same organization who are delivering the women protection program, you will find very few women as workers and very few and sometimes no women in senior positions. So who are delivering the program, who are planning the programs, how the program will sustain when the, when, uh, when the fund will stop, uh, what, will, what will happen to the women we are protecting? So actually then the protection became a very uh, small program or project that will end by the end of the funding because we didn't thought about it on a holistic and transformative uh, approach. And the money, Will be, uh, will, be, uh, will be lost actually by the end of the day. So in a very technical and practical uh, level. 
um, at Women Now, what we do, we, we don't uh, work on uh, direct humanitarian aid or de uh, delivering. We are more a development organization. However, we can see that everything is very much inter uh, interlinked, as I said. And uh, so we are a women organization that we are composed of 95% of women. We are more than 100 women working in different fields. So sometimes we know that due to social norms, due to uh, a lot of difficulties, we cannot find women who are specialized in all the sectors we, we worked on, but we invest in people. And that's something that is very important. We invest on the women so the organization get better year after year, the women are getting better. We also invest, in our understanding of development, in invest in women organization or women initiative. So a lots of uh, women initiative we supported are now completely independent. And I think that is a transformation we want. We, uh, we want for those group of, of women to be independent, to be leaders. And some, most of the time they are already leaders. We, what we want is really to listen and learn. So when we talk, when uh, when we talk also about empowerment, for me it's very important to say that, as local organization, we uh, we describe empowerment as empowering ourselves and other women. It's not only empowering the others; is to learn, to exchange. Um, my final comments, as I don't want to take so much time, also is. Um, the main answer we always got when we were discussing uh, the issue of uh, a humanitarian or protection versus development or versus long term was it is an emergency. But I think we all agree here that emergency lasts. In Syria, we have been under emergency for 10 years. In Afghanistan, it is 40 years. So we need to plan it on a transformative way so we can yeah, be part of the change we want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for mentioning the gender transformation within organizations. I think it's an important part of it. Uh, and also the leadership. It's probably key to remove those barriers and yeah, to do this empowerment, as you said, in two ways. Um, we have talked about uh, power relations already. And uh, I would like to address power relations in asserting this compatibility or incompatibility between gender transformative humanitarian action and humanitarian principles. And ask you, April, how you see it with respect to who defines what is neutral and towards whom humanitarian actors should stay neutral, for example, towards local governments or towards local civil society organizations, and also what happens if those local actors have different very different positions on gender. Uh, a very uh, interesting and also very nuanced uh, question because I think there's a multi uh, multiple ways of, of uh, responding to that. But let me just pick on this issue um, that you just raised around local actors. And I actually joined the, uh, the webinar a little bit early, so I... Um, had the opportunity and, and the privilege to hear one of the last speakers talk about the importance of local actors. And I actually want to just focus on this just a little bit because I think that this is what's been missing, right? The local voices of not only local responders to crisis, but also local communities. And at the moment, we do as a system have quite a focus on how to be much more accountable to the affected populations because it is the affected people in crises, men, women, boys and girls in all of their diversities, that should be dictating some of these discussions, right? They need to be telling us what does neutrality, neutrality look like? Um, they need to be telling us, you know, what does it mean for them to be accessing systems, you know, the mechanisms, um, you know, in which to do that. And I think in order to, um, back to the, the question of transformation, the system can only be transformed when we have these various actors um, engaged and in decision making. And I want to just get back to this point of decision making. We talk a lot about participation and decision making, but until we actually um, get to a place where local actors are equally in the room, where affected people of crisis are equally in the room and informing and influencing decisions, 
including women in the room, then we will not achieve, um, you know, this uh, this transformation. Um, and, you know, I think this is also the perfect time to also give a plug to UN women who have been working on, um, you know, just back to Maria's point around this nexus. You have an institution that is working on gender equality, that is trying to really tackle some of these uh, norms um, and really challenge that. And they actually work across the humanitarian and development um, pillars. Um, and so part of us being, uh, you know, seeing uh, their value add um, and seeing that transformation, you know, is needed and is possible, we have invited um, the IS. The ISC has invited UN Women as a member uh, into the ISC, which is an indication, again, actually quite a concrete indication that we recognize the value of transformation and that it is part and parcel of the work that we do um, in, uh, in humanitarian action. Thank you, April. And... Um Remaining in this topic on correlations and localization, um, so how can we how can we make sure that gender transformation is locally led? Because some also say that gender work is too political in terms of being Western, or it's like a sort of civili civilizing mission. And I would like to ask you, Maria, how you see these claims and what your position would be regarding them, also given that in every context there are feminist organizations or organizations working on gender, like your organization. Uh, thank you, a very important question, actually. Uh, yes, in all settings there is woman-led organization. They maybe don't define themselves as feminist, but when you work with them, you will find that... Uh, like be a real war and uh, yeah, excellent uh, champion of uh, of a feminist. So actually, I think um, getting back to my first example, uh, donor community are impacting the the area they are working on. So if I use the same example, I said when they create the trend of women protection. Uh, without looking into the transformation part of it, the development part of it, I think we, they, ha, um, they have reinforced the norms that men are protecting women. They are reinforcing uh, norms uh, that women are very vulnerable. So as April mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, so they are already impacting the work uh, in the, uh, however they, they interfere. Uh, for from our experience, what really works is really supporting community to find solution to their issues. We have been supporting for three years now a campaign locally led against child marriage. In three years, they have been able to um, uh, to stop more than 100 marriage of uh, girls and. They have been accused of being westernized, and there are women really on in, um, on camps. Like we are talking about women who don't have any access to anything, and they have been facing a lot of different uh, accusations. And through storytelling, actually, they were able to answer this accusation by telling, like, when I was bitten, I was alone. There was no one in the room, not foreign, not, uh, uh, there is no organization, non-feminist, not you and women, there is, I was alone. It is why I'm standing up for my, um, uh, for my rights now. And they also build a lie that we usually don't go uh, to, like they build uh, allies within religious uh, community or uh, religious leaders. So I think there is always local tool that can be used but we need to follow the lead of uh, affected community and believe in their leadership, actually. That is very important. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of tool when we can support it. And for me, this campaign is really a very practical, uh, uh, practical um, examples on, in terms of uh, supporting a campaign that will last even when we disappear as women now, the campaign will continue because it is a voluntary campaign led by the women themselves and the girls themselves. Uh, so you build something sustainable, 
uh, you supported the leadership of the woman who can be also effective in other issues than the child marriage. So economic crisis or anything else, they are discussing also new issue now within the circles. And, uh, and in even in terms of cost, I know, I think, hundreds of campaigns uh, against child marriage who were not able to stop one wedding. So I think this very local campaign was completely uh, uh, based on volunteer, was able to achieve uh, in three years was just amazing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and yeah, that's very inspiring work. Um, we have discussed the meaning of gender transformation and how to conceptualize it. And I would like to ask you both, um, how do you think we can avoid gender transformation becoming a buzzword that just repeated, but the meaning of which is not clear anymore or is watered down? Um, and what else should we keep in mind as we look into the future of gender equality within humanitarian action? April, may I start with you? Sure. Um, and sorry, and just as Maria was speaking, um, I was typing a message uh, in, uh, in, in the chat because I really want to uh, amplify um, this, you know, this aspect of local women. Um, I think one of the false narratives that I constantly struggle with is when uh, Global South women or local women's activism and leadership is dismissed um, you know, as you know, following in the footsteps of Western feminism or that you know, gender equality or gender transformation is something that is imposed by um, the UN or international organizations. And I actually think that we have to all actively resist that because that is so dismissive of so many of the local initiatives driven by local women, not because we asked them, but because they saw a need, because they know that you know, gender transformation is not only for women and girls in that community, but it also benefits you know, men and boys and the, the development of that whole community. So I think it's so important that we really have to you know, um, challenge this narrative. And then I guess for me, in terms of, um, you know, my optimism around this sector and where we're going with this, is that we do need to ensure that there is this political will, there is um, leadership in our sector to really promote um, and normalize this term gender transformation. And that gender equality is not seen to be something that is so foreign. Um, another very concrete example, because I've just come from this training, we are trying to indoctrinate humanitarians to concepts of feminism, transformation, intersectionality, so that they understand that these are normal terms that help us understand the communities we work with, the leadership in those communities, the power relations, the privilege that we bring, and the need to, um, you know, to keep ourselves in check. And so I think, you know, as we start to normalize these terms, they become less, um, you know, less foreign um, and less, you know, over there for the gender people. But let's make sure that we have that political will and leadership to embrace these terms um, and to not be so, you know, so scared of them. Thank you, April. Maria? Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to start to, to say gender is not only about women and girls, though, so already <laughs> April said that, but I have seen a lot of women initiative really uh, caring about boys, not becoming fighters. Uh, really. So it's also about the youth, it's uh, about the next generation. So it is not only about women and girls, uh, as I said. Uh, for me, I spoke at the beginning on the interlink uh, uh, between humanitarian development and peace, and I will add justice to it. For me, uh, it's a, also a key word that we are not uh, uh, using enough. Uh, I'm also sharing with you, my, um, um, like I'm really afraid of this old buzzword. However, I can see in terms of funds a lot of organization, feminist organization developing what they call today feminist fund. And a lot of our work, uh, 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 we couldn't car carry a lot of our work, including the campaign I just spoke about it, without having very flexible and trust-based partners. So I think there is a word also trust. 
uh, that uh, that we need really to uh, to use and uh, and to, um, to to highlight. Um, I think uh, I will stop here. I just wanted to say that about the campaign, we have a whole case study in our website so on um, on child marriage uh, cases. So I really invite you to to look at it as an example of um, of um, yeah following the lead of local community on gender transformative way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, April, once again. Thank you to both of you and to the audience. I think we are right on time. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. I think this conversation shows us that there are good arguments for gender transformation and humanitarian principles being compatible and how transformative approaches can actually help to fulfill humanitarian principles, like, for example, guaranteeing equal access to humanitarian assistance and the need to engage into gender transformative work that is locally led. The need to keep in mind that no context is immune to patriarchy and that everyone is doing gender in one way or another by simply being there, like it was mentioned about vulnerability. Uh, when a transformative approach is lacking, then uh, these narratives might be created that women are just vulnerable and their agency is not emphasized. And yes, the question is how to engage in gender without doing harm, without perpetuating unequal power dynamics and without undermining local feminist efforts and instead removing barriers to them. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. And now we'll have a break until uh, 3 p.m. Berlin time. And then we will have the last thematic session of our conference, which is on digital transformation and accountability in the context of the war in Ukraine. So I invite you to stay and follow that session. Thank you and have a lovely rest of your day.